Yes. Hi. So, BL. <laughs> okay, no, I need to calm down. If you've ever been to Japan, you might have noticed a surprising number of advertisements featuring beautiful men getting down to some sensual business. Or maybe you stumbled upon similar illustrations while browsing manga at the bookstore. Or, you know, Tumblr. Whether you knew it or not, you're bumping into boys' love. My favorite genre. Boys' love is also known as yaoi. And guys, let's get this out of the way before it gets real. Yaoi and yoi have never been the correct pronunciation. It's yaoi. And I know I'm usually the one getting the pronunciation wrong on this channel, but I'm Latina, so I think in Spanish and you know sh happens. I'ma sometimes let midorilla slip instead of midoria, but for real, repeat after me. This is true, yaoi. Okay, dale. Not gonna lie, this is a totally proud moment for me. I'm so gonna f up so much pronunciation throughout the rest of the video, but let me have this. So, boys love or yaoi is a deep world with a fascinating history, and it can be confusing or intimidating for the uninitiated. If you're totally new to the genre, here's the most important thing to know up front. Yaoi slash BL refers to manga, anime, or other media whose plot centers around the development of romantic and or sexual relationships between men. Yaoi is distinct from yuri, which focuses on relationships between women, and both of those are distinct from bara, which are created for a queer audience. Another other big characteristic of yaoi is that it's written by women for women. Its male audience is growing, but it's primarily read by straight women between 16 and 30. Confused yet? Let's get some terminology straight. Yaoi has become almost interchangeable with a few terms. The genre began as an offshoot of shoujo called shonenai, which literally translates to boys love. Boys love eventually became the more common term, along with its abbreviation, BL. And now you understand what I'm talking about in the channel trailer. Not Bud Light. BL can also refer to stuff like fanzines and doujinshi, which is basically the manga equivalent of fanfiction. The word yaoi itself appeared soon after the term shonen ai, and it's actually kind of an acronym. It comes from yamanashi ochinashi iminashi, which translates to no climax, no plot, no meaning. Some say the term was coined humorously by early yaoi publishers, and another amazing urban legend says it was a criticism slung by Osamu Tezuka. Considering he made the first anime films with explicit sex, he's one to talk. Although the terms blend together, BL tends not to be sexually explicit, the vibe is a little more innocent. On the other hand, yaoi can cross the hentai line. What? Oh, that's just the sound of us getting demonetized again for dropping the H word. <laughs> again. But where did this love story get its start? We have Morimari to thank. He wrote a trilogy of novellas about tragic love affairs between older men and beautiful young boys. The first one, A Lover's Forest, was published in 1961 and even sounds steamy. Mori was a well-known author in the Tambi style, also known as aesthetic literature. Tambi was characterized by the pursuit of and fascination with beauty. Think of Oscar Wilde and you've got the vibe. For many reasons. Tambi literature had hints of male love, but only hints. Still, many future yaoi mangaka were highly influenced by Tambi. Enter a community of female mangaka called the Year 24 Group, so named because they were all born around 1949 or the 24th year of Showa, also known as the Enlightened Harmony Period. The Year 24 Group is largely credited for creating yaoi, though the earlier works focused on platonic relationships between boys. Beautiful boys. <laughs> and because these mangaka were working within the shoujo genre, the art style of these first yaoi looks soft and kind of rounded, just like shoujo. Then came Gazetoki no Uta, or The Song of the Wind and Trees, by year 24 Takemiya Keiko. It took Takemiya nine years to find a publisher for the groundbreaking series because of controversial content like rape and drug abuse, and of course, homosexuality. Kazetoki no Uta ended up running from 1976 to 1984 in a shoujo magazine, like all year 24 work. Kaze remains incredibly influential, and it's heralded by most as the first proper yaoi. It can also be credited with starting a certain trend in early yaoi and shonen ai, tragedy. Because oh man is it sad as hell. And a clear precursor to titles like Setsuai 1989 or Sakuragari. Kaze Toki no Uta made it abundantly clear that there was an audience for this kind of thing. So two years later, June Magazine was founded in 1978. June is super important because it's the first yaoi magazine and therefore had a heavy hand in shaping what the genre would become. It was a mishmash of Tambi, Shonen Ai, and at long last, explicit content. 
And this is why I'm going to be the most demonetized host on this channel. Because well, why am I celebrating explicit content? What is wrong with me? Everything. So where was I? June became famous for furthering the whole tragedy angle too. A lot of the tragedy in early Yaoi and Shonen Ai had to do with the threat of discovery. They dealt with the repercussions of grappling with one's queer identity. It's a heavy topic during a period when it was even more frowned upon in Japan than it is today. I'll get back to that later. In any case, June and its many offshoots would come to be so synonymous with BL that June is now one of the many words you can use to refer to the genre. But June can't take all the credit for popularizing BL. In 1975, fans could share their doujinshi or homebrewed manga at the first ever comic market, also known as Comiket. Even today, this doujinshi fair remains a popular outlet especially for self-publishing mangaka, and Comiket is where yaoi really started to flourish. Many of these early fanmade shonen ai were actually parodies of popular manga and anime. Basically, female fans were taking the strong male friendships they were seeing in their favorite properties and adapting them to fulfill their BL fantasies. Just like, well, I don't know if you guys can see it, but... Ah, uh, where my own fanfiction is born. Moving on. Personal story time. My first brush with BL was fan art of Hiro Yui and Duo Maxwell from Gundam Wing. I used to be Team Relina all the way, but when the Internet of Things led me down a hole to, ahem, discovering my other favorite character was being paired with the hero, <laughs> Hiro, heh, <laughs> Hiro. Okay, on the nose there, Gundam. Well, it was the first time I actually asked myself why I'd never even considered boys being a couple to begin with. Let it be known, I was super young and going to a Catholic school, imagining same-sex pairings was not a thing one did, surrounded by the nuns. But this little encounter broke my brain in the best way possible, and suddenly everything was up for grabs, including video game characters and real-life actors or bandmates. But that's a whole other thing, and it can be pretty problematic, and we should probably dive into slash culture some other time. <clears throat> BTS. But yeah, that was my first brush with the genre. Gundam Wing fan art and doujinshis, which I printed at my Catholic school during recess. <sighs> I'm proud of that, actually. And then I discovered the rest of the doujinshi world. Tons of these authors actually went on to create original content for June. With the help of June and Kamiket, Yaoi continued to gain popularity throughout the 80s. Kazetoki no Uta got an OVA anime in 1987. Yes, an OVA, because it wasn't necessarily TV-friendly at the time. Despite its growing success, Yaoi was still considered just a sub-branch of shoujo in the 80s. It wouldn't fully break away until the 90s, the classic era of Yaoi. Yaoi really boomed and became undeniably commercially successful. Once it became its own genre, tons of anime adaptations appeared, like Gravitation, Aino Kusabi, and Fake. I'm happy to say I own the original Gravitation with no sub in VHS format though I shouldn't be proud of that. It did not age well. And I bought the fake manga and OVA and the, uh, you know, just assume I own all classic yaoi because <laughs> Fujoshi pride. And I'd like to give a special shout out to fake and Naino Kusabi in particular because before yaoi became the more fan service variation most people now associate with the genre, shows like these explored boys love in more traditional TV and film genres. Fake was a buddy cop episode of the week style comedy with a heartfelt love story at the center. And Aino Kusabi was a sci-fi futuristic dystopian drama that dealt more with issues of race and class. Iason Mink and Riki's story has little to do with their homosexuality and everything to do with Yason's status as a super blondie, while Riki was a, um, dark-haired mongrel from the slums. It's a story about oppression, of both love and the human condition. And it's a bit hard, but it endures for a reason. And I personally believe it's at the pinnacle of the 90s golden era of Yaoi. The 90s also happened to be when the term boys love was coined too. At first, fans only applied it to the manga and light novels. At this point, BL was decidedly different from Kaze's soft shoujo style. These 90s boys have pointed chins and some have intense, striking eyes. They're also all very tall for some reason, with huge hands and long fingers. Some people posit this is a direct influence of yaoi masters Ayano Yamane, right here, and a little known doujin collective the mangaka supergroup Clamp, creators of Cardcaptor Sakura and Chobits, who also got their start making BL doujinshis. By the way, should we do a video on Clamp? I'm not gonna answer, I'll let the audience answer. Guys. But not everyone was enjoying the BL craze. Keep in mind that the vast majority of mangaka, even to this day, are men. 
So along comes an entire genre based on a socially taboo subject, all written by women with the sole purpose of titillating female fans, women getting off the blasphemy. Yeah, of course, haters popped up. And yeah, there are some problematic tropes in yaoi, and we'll definitely get to that in a sec. But the pushback against yaoi initially came from straight male mangaka. And that criticism wasn't calling for a more accurate representation of queer relationships. Nuh-uh. Male mangaka were criticizing the genre in an attempt to police female desire and expression, as well as a classic practice of undermining female creators and their work. Let it be known, some of these were the same male mangaka who introduced us to the wonderful world of tentacle. I'm gonna stop right there. But a few stuffy dudes weren't enough to stop the BL train. The 90s saw a BL boom in Japan, but in Western markets, anime and manga were getting more popular in general. When something becomes popular, its devoted audience starts digging around for more. And with this fancy new thing called the internet, fans could explore message boards and other websites to discover doujinshi. And sure enough, lots of these doujinshi featured their favorite male characters coupling up. What up, Black Butler, am I right? That's seriously how the earliest Western audiences discovered BL. Through fandom. Or Neon Genesis Evangelium. When they found a show they loved, they could also discover a whole world of original, fan-made content to explore. Which naturally caused another boom. And it continues to snowball to the present day. I see you, Harry Potter slash stands, I see you. Okay, now that we know how BL came to be, let's take a look at some of the genre's tropes. We've mentioned how boys love is about boys who love. That's a no-brainer. But even from the beginning, BL had developed another defining feature. You see, most BL couples have a strong dominant submissive dynamic. The dominant partner is called the seme, which comes from a martial arts term that roughly means to attack. The seme is usually stronger, more masculine, and assumes the role of the instigator. Many also have smaller, more intense eyes. And if you've seen our Y anime about eyes, you know that can mean trouble. The submissive partner is called the uke, which means to receive. Many uke actually have feminine characteristics, although that's not always the case. Some readers also dislike uke who are too feminine. It's a slippery slope to cringy male-female relationship stereotypes. Seme and uke also have sexual connotations. They're thought of as top and bottom, respectively. And we won't go into any more detail than that, a great example of these roles in action is the opening scene of Junjo Romantica 2. Takashi, an uke with gigantic, innocent eyes, is cleaning the house. He's approached from behind by the seme and are um, forced onto the couch. I'm being very generous right now. Which brings us to another yaoi trend, non-consensual intimacy and touch. For many, this is the exact turnoff point for BL and yaoi. This trend also has its roots in Kaze Toki no Uta, where rape was central to its tragic story. It's worth noting that this isn't exclusive to yaoi. Think of American properties with similar origins like Fifty Shades of Grey. Rape in yaoi is not usually treated as an assault, but more like an uncontrollable urge of the semi. That may seem like BS to you, which is totally understandable, and a bit to me. However, this trend exists because, well, sexual psychology is complex. In yaoi, there's the fantasy, but there's also a lot of distance from reality. Which is not to say assault is never treated with gravity. It certainly is in Kaze. Another example is Underground Hotel and even Setsuai, where you could argue both guilt and obsession fuel the Stockholm Syndrome-like love story. It's sometimes similar to Nabokov's Lolita, which makes the perpetrator more sympathetic by forcing the reader to inhabit its point of view, but he's no less of a predator. Another key trend in BL is that the protagonists are often androgynous, or at least the UK is. This is not an accident. It's a mechanic to allow the reader to freely identify with either party. Which brings us to our next question. Why are so many straight women attracted to romantic stories about two men? My therapist is still asking me that. We could philosophize about this for hours and there's plenty of research and contradicting views on the subject, but also, I mean, it's nice to look at two beautiful guys. <laughs> and romance in any shape or form is popular with straight women. And everyone, really. The romance genre is practically keeping traditional publishing alive. It's the cash cow of the book industry, y'all. Fact, we like romance and we like drama. Sue us. And boys, some of us. Anyway, the women who make up this fandom <coughs> are called Fujoshi, which translates to rotten women. 
Like the term yaoi, Fujoshi likely originated from within the community itself as a light-hearted self-deprecation. But it still has a stigma attached to it. Being a Fujoshi is considered a socially undesirable trait in Japan. So it's a particularly intense, tight-knit fandom, even by anime community standards. Because how dare you women consume media that takes the masculine ideal and twist it into an unrealistic and over-sexualized shape that is not even anatomically correct to fit your fantasies? Definitely not a double standard, nope. The rotten bit refers to the community's exceptionally hardcore fanaticism, as well as the taboo subject matter of their reading. Because homosexuality is still a taboo in Japan, BL and Fujoshi get a bad reputation. Though, in an unexpected twist, a surprising number of BL protagonists don't identify as gay. Perhaps even the majority don't. They are in love with the other person. It's as if being in love with another man is a sexy exception, a new, unexplored territory. BL is not written to appeal to or accurately reflect the experiences of a queer audience, but rather a heterosexual one. It doesn't show gay couples, it shows the desires of straight women. And that's why Yaoi and Bara can be so distinct from one another. Still, there's understandable criticism of BL portrayals of male relationships. Plus, as Fujobait, or fan service for Fujoshi, becomes a trend in mainstream anime, it can sometimes blur the line with queer baiting. It can easily slip into fetishizing the LGBTQ community. Many feel that BL itself is a kind of queer baiting. Although many fans feel that BL is also about female sexual empowerment and catering to the female gaze, which almost always complicates the issue. Especially if, like me, you're both a Fujoshi and an ally. But more and more, BL does recognize its characters as queer, or features coming out as part of the story. So it's worth taking a look at queer culture in Japan. Queer couples are becoming more common in mainstream Japanese media, but as I've mentioned, it's still largely taboo. It's still considered shameful to come out. So there's largely a don't ask, don't tell vibe in the professional sphere. Gay marriage is not currently legal although several pioneering couples are suing the Japanese government in an effort to change that. Yet, BL's audience continues to grow. More men are starting to write BL, although the vast majority of BL mangaka are still women. There's actually an anthology of pure male sensitivity from eight male mangaka who normally write in other styles, including the man behind Ace Attorney, Maekawa Kazuo. I should also highlight a masterful work of the genre, the award-winning What Did You Eat Yesterday by Fumi Yoshinaga, recently adapted into a live-action drama, what Did You Eat Yesterday is not a BL title meant to explore sexual tropes or titillate. It's a sensitive and mature portrayal of a 40-something gay couple living their life in modern Japan. They tackle family approval, office dynamics, and commitment issues. Oh, and there's a ton of recipes! This title has been groundbreaking and it sets the stage for what the future of BL could be and why it's so important to have let the genre evolve in the first place. Because What Did You Eat Yesterday would have never been possible without those early yaoi problematic as they were. They sparked a conversation, one we continue to have and improve upon to this day. The male audience of yaoi is also growing, so much so that they also have a nickname, Fudanshi. They're not here for just the steaminess. A Japanese survey said male fans are drawn either by the different portrayal of male emotion or by seeing a close social bond between men. Come through intimate male friendships! Celebrate the Makoto to your Haru, the Suzaku to your Lelouch, the uh, Bakugo to your Midoriya? I need to get off Tumblr though. BL's international popularity is also continuing to explode. There are American webcomics that obviously take inspiration from Yaoi, and there's even an annual Yaoi convention in California, YaoiCon. And it's beginning to permeate mainstream fiction too. Captive Prince is a surprise international bestseller. The author, C.S. Pacat, named Yaoi and BL as a major influence and is a queer identifying author herself. Given the history of the genre, it's only fitting that Captive Prince got its start as a self-published online series before it was picked up by a publisher and became a breakout hit. Now Captive Prince has its own light novel adaptation in Japan, full circle. BL itself is also constantly evolving as a genre. More and more are, well, ditching that no climax, no plot thing. Instead of getting right to the juicy stuff, more properties are favoring a slow burn build of the character's relationship. Also, as the trope gets older, more authors are mixing up the relationship between Seme and Uke. Sometimes the Uke acts as the aggressor. Some mangaka are even doing away with the dynamic altogether, which also shows a clear evolution in the way women are reinterpreting their own roles. As gender dynamics become healthier, well, so will Yaoi. Yaoi is also strongly influencing other genres of anime and manga, even beyond Fujo Bait. For one, there are more anime that feature hardcore Yaoi fans as the protagonists, such as the Fujoshi, Kai, 
of Kiss Him, Not Me, and the aptly titled The High School Life of a Fudanshi, where the Fudanshi in question is straight. At the same time, more mainstream anime and manga are featuring male-male relationships. Although that may not be entirely because of BL, its growing popularity probably helped quiet naysayers. I mean, we got an openly gay Gundam character. <laughs> My full circle. But the biggest example of BL's influence is the runaway hit Yuri on Ice. There's intense debate between fans whether Yuri, which features an openly gay male couple, is BL or not. But most people seem to agree that, I mean, it's a sports anime. And yet, it's a sports anime that serves as an excellent example of how BL's influence has grown to blur genre lines of even mainstream anime. It'll be interesting to see how BL keeps getting bigger and bigger. Yuri and lesbian couples, on the other hand, that's a topic for another day. I'm Crystal Marie with Get in the Robot, your anime explainer.